Josie start rolling, that would be fantastic. Do I get a notification on here? That's what I do, isn't it? If not, we'll restart. You're on. Um, that would be a win. Can I ask you before we... profession <laughs> so uh, bear with me um, as I said my name is Jill Cousins um, I have the pleasure of being the director of uh, this museum I've been here for uh, a couple of years I actually came from uh, Europeana which this project uh, falls under which is a very large platform for digital material across Europe um, it has collected the, the pictures, the paintings, the objects, the archives, um, an awful lot of library uh, books, journals, etc., cetera, um, grey material from many different um, institutions across, Euro uh, across Europe. Uh, I think the, the um, database now stands at something like 50 million. And uh, part of what we did there was always to try and collect uh, the, the sort of personal stories, the, the memorabilia around it. And we did um, European 1914-1918, and actually there was a collection here for that, and those stories are all up online. And a lot of those have now been transcribed. And one of the aims for the data that we are collecting for uh, Ardna Krusha would be, if there is something written on the back of the postcard, would be to transcribe that uh, data. And, and one of the things that's fantastic is because it's across the whole of Europe, you've got all those languages uh, to, to call on. Anyway, so welcome uh, to this Ardna Krusha Memories uh, Symposium. It's great to see you all here today. Um, I think Ardna Krusha captures the imagination it's a massive feat of engineering, uh, and it was at a time when you didn't have the tools which are available today. People uh, who put it together had an incredible vision, really, to make it happen in the first place, and the ability to see it through. It's all very well to have the vision, but you, you need to be able to, to, to see the whole thing through. The idea that you can change a landscape, uh, hold back the water, harness it for change and, and progress. And, and uh, the, I, I find that whole thing amazing. And I actually come from the Netherlands, uh, where things like the Afslaut Dijk um, were built at the same period, so that's 1927. And that held back the North Sea. Um, so it put the division between the North Sea and what became the Isselmeer. And it's, it's got the same feeling about it, this incredible feat of engineering, and of course, in the Netherlands, they are masters at holding back water uh, and managing water. But what I found incredible with this story that Ireland was really the first country um, in the world to put in together a hydroelectric scheme of this magnitude. And it was actually only overtaken by the Hoover Dam um, the Americans always have to get their, their look in there. So it was overtaken by the Hoover Dam when that started building in the 1930s. But I'm sure I'm telling you all things that uh, you already know. So as well as the, the much bigger story about the, the creation of electricity, um, the, the construction works, and the social experiment of very two different peoples, the Germans and the Irish, um, not to mention 
the rivalry between the, the locals, uh, the people from Connemara and the Corkonians. So I think uh, that will come up in uh, one of the talks. Uh, this is very much a stor the story about people's lives and work. So that's what we are hoping to be able to tell today. So we will start with um, two speakers, um, Deirdre McParland from the ESB archives and uh, Michaela Stair, who uh, is from Fresno College in California. We've got her up extremely early uh, to do this. Um, they are videos that you are being shown, uh, but it is all being live streamed. And then um, technology permitting, I was once told don't work with children, animals or technology, but uh, we have a great team here. Um, we will be able to have live Q&A sessions uh, with both the speakers. So please, please, please come up with some questions. Um, don't be pressured, but I'm sure some of the things that they say will spark a lot of the knowledge that you already have. Um, the, after those, we're then going to go into a storytelling session. So that is going to be led by Peggy, um, who many of you know. So she has been doing a lot of research um, and also a lot of the interviews with a lot of people for the collection uh, days. This um, symposium connects to, as I said, a Europeana project. It's called Europe at Work, and it is the collection of personal stories and memorabilia about the Shannon hydroelectric scheme. I think many of you will have stories to tell, and um, I'm hoping to hear some of them uh, today. And for the people that are watching online, um, Remember that we uh, actually will go on collecting these uh, stories. You can submit them. If you are close to Limerick tomorrow, there are still some slots open to be able to uh, submit your, your memorabilia, get it digitized, and the, the story taken. Um, so if you're, if you're watching online and you've got stories um, or memorabilia with photos, maps, hard hats, German lederhosen that somebody purloined, uh, songs that were sung, uh, diaries or articles from the period. Those we would also like to end up on this database. So it's part of a database with lots of other countries who have contributed uh, their uh, cultures of work. So it could have been factories in Latvia, um, uh, markets in France, it, it's really right the way across Europe and these stories have been collected. But this particular one was dreamt up by Killian Downing. Um, I think he was working at the ESB archives at the time. And he also is the coordinator for Europeana. And he came up with the idea of doing Ardna uh, Krusha because it was so significant as a piece of work. And because there are some considerable archives on it, obviously, uh, within the ESB. Um, if uh, yeah, you do have more stories um, to submit, then you can find the link on the Europeana, um, sorry, on the Hunt Museum site. You can probably find it on Europeana as well, uh, but on the Hunt Museum site. Um, and you can book yourself um, in for us to digitise it uh, for you. Or we will arrange a telephone interview for you. So I said we're going to hear from two great speakers. Um, Deirdre McParland is a senior archivist at the ESB and Michaela Stair from Fresno College in California. And then we have Peggy Ryan kicking off a round of uh, story at telling. Anybody got any questions so far? all raring to go with uh, stories to tell. So I think um, in that case, we will move on to the first speaker. So Deirdre is the senior archivist from the ESB. She has over 20 years experience in the archive sector. Uh, she specializes in uh, business archives 
and in 2015 she was appointed as the senior archivist to the ESB. Deirdre is a regular guest speaker at national and international conferences and seminars and a regular contributor to um, documentaries around the Shannon scheme and heritage of the ESB. Her work's been published in the Engineers Ireland, Sunday Business Post, Irish Archives, Archives and Records Association and, Ir and Irish Central. Um, she's collaborated and curated on several exhibitions including Guinness Storehouse, the Little Museum of Dublin, the Heritage Council, St. Patrick's Festival and the University of Hertfordshire. Um, her talk is Shedding Light on the Shannon Scheme and the Electrification of Ireland. Uh, the foundation of the ESB was based on a vision of continuously Im to improve the lives of Irish people. So she will be talking about Ireland's first national grid and the largest engineering of its project of its kind in Europe. Um, and she will look at the transformative impact of the scheme on the social, economic and industrial development of Ireland, all sourced from the rich heritage which, which is preserved in the ESB archives. So are we ready to roll the first speaker? There is a bit of a pause in between the slides for you to be aware of. That was a, a slight voiceover problem that she had. So time to take it in. Thank you. Hello, my name is Deirdre from ESB Archives and I am delighted to be speaking to you all today on Ardnick Russian Memories. Just before I begin, I would like to tell you just a little bit about ESB Archives. Our archives are preserved in a purpose-built archive, the first building of its kind in Ireland to adhere to the newest international standards for conservation of cultural heritage. Located on St Margaret's Road in Finglas, our building was officially opened at the beginning of this year. It provides a stable and permanent environment for our precious archives using low energy passive sustainable design. The collection consists of over 8,000 archival boxes reflecting all aspects of ESB. We hold records of generation stations from our first engineering project, the, San the Shannon Scheme, which you will be hearing all about shortly, to the Transformative Rural Electrification Scheme, advertising, marketing and public relations collections, internal publications, engineering maps, drawings and a substantial photographic film and oral history archive. Our digital platform, esbarchives.ie, has opened the stories of the electrification of Ireland. Since its launch in 2016, we have had over 1.5 million views. We welcome research inquiries from diverse global audiences, including documentary and filmmakers, publishers, researchers and academics. In these unprecedented times, our digital platform has ensured that our records remain accessible to all of our researchers. And today, from the information that we preserve, I am delighted to share with you the transformative story of the Shannon Scheme and the electrification of Ireland. In the early 1900s, only 1% of the population in Ireland had access to an electricity supply. Before ESB was established, electricity generation, distribution and supply was owned and managed by approved electricity undertakers, which was typically a local authority or private business. From researching the annual reports that we hold in the archives, we know that in Limerick alone, there were six private electricity undertakings or suppliers, which you are viewing now. All of these electricity undertakers, along with the dispersed suppliers all over the country, worked independently of each other and used different electrical systems with varying standards. There was no national electricity provider. The reality for most Irish people living at this time was a life of drudgery, particularly in rural Ireland, as domestic and industrial chores were extremely physically demanding.
but following years of economic and political upheaval, the future looked a little brighter when the Irish Free State was established in 1922. This young gentleman, who you're viewing on screen now, Thomas McLaughlin, was a young Irish engineer, and he gained employment with the German engineering firm Siemens Stuttgart in Berlin shortly after achieving his PhD in engineering. While he was employed in Berlin, he took the opportunity to research the design of power plants in Europe. McLaughlin firmly believed that electricity was the great key to the economic uplift of the country and that electricity must be provided on a national scale, cheap and abundant. He soon convinced his colleagues in Siemens to look at the possibility of using Ireland's longest river, the Shannon, to generate electricity and build Ireland's very first national hydroelectric power station at Arthna Crusha in County Clare. Now, this wasn't a new idea. The proposal to harness the River Shannon was initially suggested as far back as 1844 by the Irish chemist Sir Robert Kane in his book, The Industrial Resources of Ireland. He concluded that 34,000 horsepower could be harnessed from the Shannon. A number of further proposed alternative schemes had been considered, but none had been implemented due to political and economic considerations. We can gleam an insight into McLaughlin's vision and determination at this time through an interview that he did with Radio Erin, which was broadcast on the 10th of January 1931 after he saw the Shannon scheme realised. In this interview, McLaughlin declared that no sincere student could have lived through that whole period of intense national enthusiasm without feeling a passionate desire to do all in his power to assist in national reconstruction and in the building up of the country by development from within. These were powerful words, but we all know that actions speak louder than words. McLaughlin returned back to Ireland in December of 1923. While he was home, he took this opportunity just a few days after Christmas to informally meet the new Irish government, many of whom were his college friends. And he presented his and Siemens plans to harness the River Shannon and build one of the largest engineering projects of its kind in Europe at that time. The government members, while they liked the plans, they weren't 100% convinced. So they hired an international team of experts to review the proposals. The plans as set out were approved by the experts with some modifications. They were then adopted into a government white paper following much debate in the Dáil and a formal contract was signed with Siemens. McLaughlin, together with his colleagues in Siemens, had convinced the government that a national solution for the production of electricity would be preferable to a local one that served just the environs of Dublin only. Construction of the Shannon scheme then began in Ardna Crusha in County Clare in August of 1925. The state invested a whopping £5.2 million, which was 20% of the national budget. So no pressure at all on young Thomas to make it a success. At a time of huge unemployment, the scheme at its height, it provided jobs for just under 5,000 employees. It was an impressive collaboration and sharing of expertise between German and Irish engineers. There were about 1,000 skilled engineers working on the scheme and up to 4,000 labouring staff on the scheme. The logistics were absolutely spectacular. A temporary power station was needed to power the various workshops and an electric crane. Four bridges and nine rivers were constructed and many streams were diverted. Siemens also installed 100 kilometres of narrow gauge railway with some 100 locomotives and 3,000 wagons to move the massive amounts of clay and rock which were excavated. A transmission and distribution network was also built to bring electricity to all the major cities and towns in Ireland.
Scenes like these were familiar in the local landscape. Heavy-duty machinery like generators had to make their way through the streets of Limerick City, passing well-known landmarks of King John's Castle and the Treaty Stone. Throughout the construction of the scheme, Siemens also produced a total of 39 progress reports from 1925 to 1929. These reports are all digitised and available on our website. They cover a range of topics and offer unparalleled insights into all aspects of the scheme's construction and the engineering feats. Each four-page report is based on a single aspect of the scheme and contains a number of maps, plans and photographs. What is particularly interesting about the reports is that they capture anecdotes of the scheme and provide an, insa an insight into the social mindset at the time of the project. A report from April of 1927 noted that the sounds of rock blasting at the site were reminiscent of guns firing at the front during the years of the Great War, which is still fresh in the memory of many. Reports document the beginnings of a sense of community at Ardna Krusha and an insight into the lives of the workers. Camps of Irish and German workers began to spring up around Ardna Krusha, bringing with them a host of temporary amenities, from Ardna Krusha tea gardens, to hairdressers and cobblers, to a special canteen to cater for the German cuisine, with the November 1926 edition noting that anyone who was previously acquainted with this locality would not recognise it now. Detailed description of the camps is reported in the January 1927 edition, focusing on the largest camp on the Ardna Crusher site. The report gives a fascinating insight into the facilities for the workers. The report states, The Irish camp, which can accommodate 750 men, consists of four smaller and seven larger huts, of a building containing baths, of large recreation and dining premises, which can seat 600 people. There is also a large kitchen with a canteen and a provision shop attached. The smaller huts are built of concrete and steel frames. The latter are divided into three rooms, each of which can accommodate 30 men. One of the larger huts is for the use of skilled workmen and is divided into six small flats. Each bedroom has its own lavatory with running water. The report further notes that there is a fumigator in the house where the baths are situated and all the bedclothes are cleaned and disinfected here at regular intervals. Every workman receives one bed, one mattress, one pillow, two sheets, three blankets in summer and four in winter, a knife, a fork, a spoon, a mug, a plate and a locker on arrival. All premises have electric light and are heated in winter with the aid of large stoves. A filter connected with the water tower conveys pure drinking water to all premises. To provide recreation and instruction for the workers, especially during weekends, cinema performances with musical accompaniment, gramophone concerts and wireless news from all over the world can be enjoyed in turn in the large recreation hall. The daily papers, table games and camp library are at the disposal of the workers. The men can indulge in hurling, Gaelic football, soccer and boxing. A regular football ground and hurling field with goalposts is situated 100 yards away from the camp. The spiritual needs of the men were also catered for with mass celebrated every Sunday in the camp. The German camp was situated about 150 yards away from the Irish camp. It consisted a row of houses built of timber and concrete. Many of the Germans who lived there also brought their families. Married Germans lived in the wooden houses which you are seeing now and a German teacher was also at Ardna Krusha to give lessons to between 30 and 40 German children. Throughout the early years of construction, Patrick McGilligan, who is now Minister for Industry and Commerce, was considering the best options on how best to manage the scheme once all the electricity was generated. He concluded, and probably quite influenced 
by McLaughlin that such rapid development could only be achieved through unified control of production and distribution. And thus, the first semi-state body in Ireland, the ESB, was born on the 11th of August 1927. Thomas McLaughlin was the natural choice to become the first managing director for ESB. In early 1928, McLaughlin visited the United States and he began benchmarking against major projects there. He quickly came to the conclusion that he needed to advertise and educate future customers about the benefits of electricity, which to most Irish people was a new commodity and a new technology. He headhunted Dublin journalist Ned Lawler to become public relations officer for ESB. This was widely believed to be the first appointment of its kind in Europe. Long before social media, television and commercial radio, the only way to ensure messaging was conveyed to the homes and people of Ireland was through the national and local newspapers. ESB began an extensive advertising campaign from September 1928. This advertisement was one of the very first advertisements advertising the fact that Ardna Crusher was open to the public. People from every parish in Ireland were encouraged and welcomed to visit the site while construction was ongoing and to no doubt instill a sense of national pride and to see this mighty project in the making. ESB operated a tourist office in Limerick and collaborated with transport companies to bring buses of tourists to the site. Within the first nine months of opening for tours, 85,000 people had descended on Ardna Crusha. Advertising messages were direct. Copies such as a child can do it was utilised to convey how simple it was to use electricity. The dashing gentleman in the middle there was used to convey one of our greatest assets, which was our people and our electricians, to deliver excellent customer service. And the copy on that ad noted, our aim is to give you an electrical installation that will make you a satisfied customer and to give it as quickly, quietly and smoothly as our highly trained electricians can do the job. The style of language in the ads provided a sense of empowerment and ownership to everybody in Ireland. This ad here, it states that in industry and in the home, electricity does the heavy work easily and cheaply. It is the modern labour saver and youth saver. It converts the workman and housewife from labour slaves into directors of machinery. We also instilled confidence into the people of Ireland, declaring that the Shannon has been harnessed to lighten human burdens and to brighten human lives. A series of cigarette cards without government health warnings were produced detailing the construction of the scheme. Booklets such as these, The House You Want, were also produced alongside postcards and slideshows and films, all produced and utilised by the Public Relations Department of ESB on a nationwide lecturing tour with the focus on proper systems of both lighting in the home and in the shop. Early advertising was focused on women and the coming of electricity was very much promoted at providing more leisure time to women and the end of drudgery. Headline adverts like these, such as electricity will set you free, noting that electric way is the simplest, cleanest, cheapest, quickest way to freedom for the mistress of the home. Electricity will set you free from drudgery. Electricity will do your work under your direction. Electricity will add hours of leisure to your day and years of pleasure to your life. The health giving value of electricity was utilised in early advertising of the scheme, which was also similar to how other brands advertised against the backdrop of an outbreak of influenza at that time. This particular ad is stating, have you thought of electric cooking in connection with your health? No fumes, no matches, no ashes, no dirt, no smoke or danger of explosion. Trained sales lady demonstrators were employed at ESB retail stores when they first opened in April of 1929, just before the scheme was finalised. 
They provided consumers and prospective consumers with all information regarding the use and advantage of electric rangers, water heaters, washing machines and other domestic electrical appliances. Cooking demonstrations were arranged in towns, followed up by practical demonstrations in the homes of consumers and prospective purchasers. As it was women's responsibility to look after all of the family at this time, the benefits of reading under a good light were heavily promoted, particularly in relation to children's development and education. The Shannon scheme also captured the imagination of renowned local Limerick artist Sean Keating, who was fascinated by modern energy and technology. We know that Keating was on the site of Ardna Crusha as early as 1926, sketching and painting as a freelance artist. It is recorded anecdotally that during rain showers or blasting operations, he took cover in a steel skip, which was always left lying close by to where he worked. After one of these blasts, he emerged from cover to find his easel and canvas flattened by flying rocks. Keating's paintings and drawings of activity on the site provide a colourful and evocative record of the project and were acquired by ESB in the early 1930s. His foresight has ensured that Ireland has a fishing legacy of drawings and paintings that capture the most significant development of the early years in the history of the Irish Free State. During the four years of construction, a total of 52 workers sadly lost their lives while working on the scheme. 19 of those lives were lost in a storm in March 1925, when a ship en route from Germany to Limerick docks was loaded with rails, trains and other heavy machinery never made its final destination. In Ardna Crusha today, those who lost their lives are remembered at the station with a permanent memorial there. Following four years of intensive engineering and construction, the scheme was officially opened by President of the Executive Council, William Cosgrave, on the 22nd of July 1929. It was the first fully integrated national electricity system in the world, and its opening was reported in national and international media. Three months later, in October 1929, the power generated from the mighty Shannon began to be exported to ESB's newly built distribution network, connecting the cities, towns and many large villages to the national grid. Within five months, over 40,000 homes and businesses were connected to an electricity supply directly from the Shannon. Throughout the early years, priority was given to towns that had no previous electric power from private undertakings. Towns that had electricity before the Shannon scheme normally took longer to be connected to the grid, as they often required re-engineering of their local network and installations. Approximately 160 local private undertakings also had to be acquired by ESB throughout the late 1920s and early 1930s. Over time, the small local stations were decommissioned as the local network became connected to the grid. Records of when each city, town and large village were connected to an electricity supply from the Shannon scheme can be found on our website. In Limerick alone, 32 towns and villages received electricity from the Shannon scheme from 1929 onwards. And you can find a lot more about when your own particular town was connected to an electricity supply on our website there. The Shannon Scheme was one of the largest engineering projects of its day and was a revolutionary infrastructural development, bringing electricity to all parts of the country. The scale and importance of the scheme made it an economic centrepiece for the development of the modern Irish state. It paved the way for the Rural Electrification Scheme in the 1940s, described as the greatest social revolution since the land reforms of the 1880s and changed the landscape of Ireland's economic, social and cultural history forever. By the end of the scheme in 1978, ESB had connected over 1,300 towns, villages and parishes and one million homes throughout Ireland. In 
In 2002, the Shannon scheme joined the ranks of one of the world's major engineering feats when it received two major heritage awards. The International Milestone by the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers and the International Landmark Award by the American Society of Civil Engineers. To this day, the legacy of this mammoth undertaking continues to supply the same 86 megawatts of clean energy as it did back in 1929, making a lasting contribution to the industrial, commercial and social development of the country. It provides inspiration as ESB embraced the energy challenges of the coming decades, seeking to create a brighter future and leading Ireland's transition towards a low-carbon society. I hope you enjoyed my talk today and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Deirdre, now I hope we are able to go live to Deirdre. Hello everybody. Hey. <laughs> Um, Deirdre, uh, um, uh, unfortunately, couldn't make it here today because of the, the, the restrictions on Dublin until actually towards the end of last week, we were really hoping to have you here in person, but uh, it's great to have you here virtually um, and to see if there are any questions from the audience about your uh, talk. Anybody? Got anything they want to, to pull up? Yeah. How much of the country's electricity did uh, Arden Croatia provide at the beginning? Um, at the beginning, it connected all the major towns and cities, so it provided, um, yeah, it provided the country, the towns and cities, with their electricity supply. So at that stage, in the beginning, from 1929 to the 1930s, it was one third of the population. And then, like the second phase of the Shannon scheme, then was the rural electrification project. Um, and when that project was finalised and um, that was fully completed in 1978, then 99% of the population of Ireland had access to an electricity supply. Anybody else from the audience at the moment? I've got one um, online uh, from Adrian Murphy who actually is from Europeana and he um, has run a lot of these Europe at work uh, uh, things across. Um, he said, Ireland, Portugal, France, Luxembourg, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Italy, Sweden and Finland. I didn't know that. Um, Adrian wants to know, uh, Deirdre, what, how much was the German involvement known at the time? Was it part of the advertising and the communication? Sorry, Jill, I didn't quite get that question. There's a bit of an echo in the Sorry. room there. How there was much something about the advertising. I only caught the last yeah. bit. So uh, Adrian wanted to know how much was the German involvement known? Was it part of any advertising or communication at the time? Bit of a delay. Can, sorry, can you just say that one more time? Yep, yeah, sure. Uh, Adrian wanted to know um, how much was the German involvement known? Was it part of any advertising or communication? Oh, okay, there, got that. No, yeah, the sound is much better. Um, well, in terms of the communication, so Siemens were the project managers. So they were really great communicators on the scheme. So I mentioned there in the talk, and um, they produced progress reports. And that was from 1926 until 1929, 39 progress reports. And so they detailed all aspects of the scheme. So they would have been released um, publicly. So very much um, speaking you know, to the public um, about the scheme. In terms of the actual advertising collection, so that's something that ESB themselves would have led shortly after we were established. So um, we left that in 1928. So the advertising content, though, that was really more focused on the sense of kind of nation building and educating the public um, on the benefits of electricity. So there wasn't so much communication there about um, Siemens being the project leaders on the scheme in terms of 
the, the, the benefits that electricity was going to bring to, to um, people's lives. But um, Siemens very much led the, the communication in terms of the progress reports um, for the whole scheme. Um, I realise I need to look that way rather than to the side when on camera. <laughs> um, I have another question from Rose Ryan. I'm sure she's related to somebody here. Um, when were the current ESB flat roofed houses built? Um, the, the current house is down there in County Clare. Um, I believe they would have been built, I need to confirm this within our records, but they would have started to be built from the 1930s onwards. But if you're looking to find out more specific information relating to BSB houses for staff, um, I, I will be able to answer that. Um, if, you, if anybody would like to drop me an email afterwards, that's no problem. Um, I had a, a question, which is actually what kind of resistance there was to the scheme when it was built, and, and uh, what have you got in the archives on that? Okay, I think I just got the beginning of that one, Jill. Um, uh, sorry, uh, what? To the scheme, I think, was the question. Yeah, yeah, what kind of resistance was there to the scheme? Uh, well, at the beginning, um, there would have been quite a lot of resistance. Um, I mean, it, it was going to be the largest engineering project of its kind in Europe. Um, so it was a massive undertaking for the government. It was going to be a huge financial investment, 20% of the national budget. So there was a lot of debate in the Doyle at the time about, um, you know, whether we should harness the River Shannon or sorry, harness the River Liffey first and just provide electricity to Dublin and its environs. Um, so there, there would have been some quarters where there absolutely was a resistance and the scheme was referred to by some as a white elephant. But I think McLaughlin and obviously uh, McGilligan and um, Patrick McGilligan, the Minister for Industry and Commerce, was very much behind the scheme. So they really helped, um, I think, to influence other government members on um, the benefits of a national scheme rather than just a Dublin focused scheme. And again, I think it came back to kind of McLaughlin's vision at the time as well, that his real vision was that the Shannon scheme, it should be harnessed to provide electricity on, on a national scale um, to everybody in Ireland. So I think he very much stuck to his original vision there in ensuring that, um, that the Shannon scheme itself um, went ahead rather than just focusing on just the lift fee initially. Any, yeah, Tom. Hi Deirdre, can you hear me all right? Um, yeah. Tom McKay was my name, and my grandfather was Joel Farrell, one of the first engineers on the project. And looking through his notes, uh, I noted between Patrick McGilligan and Thomas McLaughlin and Joe, they, were, they had very nationalistic views, almost anti-British. Was it noted within the halls of London and the British government how much this was very much a German-Irish um, engineering feat and how they were ignored in terms of the process of going ahead was any of that picked up anywhere? Uh, we, we don't hold exact information on that in our archives because I guess our archives kind of, they start from the foundation of ESB in 1927. Um, I would say information like that would have been more so captured in the National Archives records. Um, but I, I feel though the, the, the reason though that I think it was the, the Germans that um, that, that led the project, that it was a German firm that led the project in terms of Siemens. It was really, it would have been from McLaughlin's relationship, I think, from Siemens, that it was when he was working with them that he went to them with the idea, you know, to harness the River Shannon. So together it was McLaughlin and, um, it was McLaughlin and Siemens that drew up the plans. Um, and because he was already an employee of them, um, that is how I think Siemens, you know, they were involved from the very start because of McLaughlin's relationship with them. Okay, I have a second question. Thanks for asking that. And this is to do with the rollout of consumers. They struggled between 1932 and 34 to bring on new consumers. Numbers I have 
you know, to my grandfather's notes, where they had 77,000 consumers in 1932, only a couple of years after the scheme of coming on board. But then there was a drought in 1933, which meant they couldn't generate any power for several months. Um, was, was any of that noted in terms of, was there a lack of confidence among Irish people that this was, you know, you know a false herring to a certain extent? Any records there? Um, not, not exactly, no. I haven't come across Pacific, um, that's a, I guess a very Pacific part, uh, Pacific area of research there. Um, but our records would show, so in the annual reports every year, we show the increase of consumers um, throughout those years. And like we do know from those reports that um, our consumer numbers did increase. So for example, in 1929, our consumers, they went from 36,000 to by 1936, then we had, um, it was 130,000 consumers. So I think that would that would show that the numbers of consumers um, were raised, were rising, and um, specifically for those years where there was a drought, um, we can certainly check and see. I wouldn't have exact numbers for each year on the top of my head, but uh, we can certainly check those um, figures out for you. Or those figures are they are available in our annual reports, and all that research resources are available um, online on our website. Okay, thank you, Deirdre. Question to that, Deirdre, which is, um, I, I was quite curious about, so the, all the adverts were towards the electricity saving time and all the appliances that came to it, but I wondered what the kind of take up of that was as well, uh, particularly for that period. So you're running up to the Second World War, um, it's all of those, that, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. So um, ESB opened up retail stores. The first one was opened up in St. Stephen's Green in Dublin. Um, and they opened retail stores just three months before the official opening of the scheme. And th the rationale for opening up the stores was to, it was all part of that whole advertising and education of the public on the money benefits of electricity and really making the country um, electricity, electricity conscious. So in order to show the benefits of, you know, why you should, you know, cook with electricity and all the benefits that electricity would give you in the home. Um, they sold all the electrical appliances in the retail store. So first of all, in Dublin, and then there was demonstrations throughout um, the country as well. And just in terms of the affordability as well, um, we know that kind of early on, I think the, the kettles would have been kind of the, the, the most, um, the, the kind of the, the cheapest option available to people so people gradually were buying different electrical appliances and ESB would have set up um, a kind of various different higher purchase schemes and uh, basically kind of like little retail loans to make it as affordable so spreading out the cost of buying each electrical equipment in their homes. Okay. Um... Anybody else burning to ask a question? I'm missing one of the reasons the problem's not standing up. Uh, the, I also wondered, so we, we saw photos that you've got, you've got there, um, and, and so I was sort of curious about the ESB archival records and what other media that you might have uh, within the uh, archives as well as written material. Yeah. So um, we have original photographs of the scheme and all the original um, reports of the scheme. And we would also have um, a, a film archive as well. Um, now the, the actual, the earliest um, film reference that we have, um, or that was taken of this, this, this scheme, it actually isn't in our archives. Um, it was actually filmed by Pape Films and they were on the site of the Shannon scheme down in Arden Crusher in 1928. And um, you can actually view some snippets of those original um, film footage on the, the Pathé website. And we also have, um, we've digitized some of our film archive collection and they're also available on our website as well under the film archive. Hmm. 
Um, and of course, you've got some great paintings. We do indeed, yes. Um, we have the, the Sean Keating artworks. Um, they were, they're very much part of the, the, her the overall heritage collection um, of, of ESP. So I know the, probably the most um, famous um, Sean Keating painting relating to the scheme, Night Candles Are Burnt Out, is uh, on display um, in the Hunt Museum. But we'd have um, quite a significant collection um, of Sean Keating. He painted over 30 paintings um, of, of the scheme. Um, from 1926 onwards. Uh, I'm going to thank you for making that plug for me. Actually, it's on this floor, if anybody wants to go and have a look at it afterwards. Uh, that's Sean Keating's uh, Night's Candle um, are burnt out. Um, I have one last question, um, which is actually should come from your piano, really, from the, rather than me. Uh, do you have plans to put this material that you have got in the ESB archives up onto uh, Europeana be nicely complemented by the stories that are being collected from people here yeah well we have um I guess we have a lot of an awful lot of content already from the Shannon scheme um up on our website and I know for the um Europeana project here um I think actually, Joe, I think it was your father that we provided a, a photograph from our collection that featured Joe O'Farley in, in the photograph. So uh, we have um, provided that to Europeana there as well. That'd be great. I think uh, having this up on a site that is about uh, culture across Europe um, and, and particularly this kind of material would be, I think, very valuable. Um, I'm going to thank uh, Deirdre on our behalf. I think she will uh, stay online. I'm hoping uh, that you will. Um, okay. And that uh, we will then move on to our next speaker. So thank you, Deirdre, so much thank you. Uh, for your talk. <laughs> so my next speaker... Um, is Dr. Michaela Sturr, I probably mispronounced that actually. She's the history instructor at the Department of History and Political Science in Fresno City College. Um, Michaela is a professor in the history department in California. She received her PhD from Marquette University where she completed her dissertation entitled Illuminating the Irish Free State, Nationalism, National Identity and the Promotion of the Shannon Electric Hydroelectric Scheme. Uh, part of this work has also been published in the anthology A Formative Decade, Ireland in the 1920s. Her research deals with the intersections of politics, religion, education, race and gender as they converged in discussions and promotion, pr promotional material around the scheme. She wrote a chapter in her dissertation on the local and regional implications of the Shannon Scheme, and she's very interested in how the Limerick community discussed Irishness and race as they interacted with workers from Connemara and uh, Germany. So I think we can roll the video for uh, Michaela and then ask her some questions afterwards. Thank you. Hello, I'm Michaela Stair, and I'm delighted to be talking to you today about workers on the Shannon Scheme. I'd like to thank the Hunt Museum and Europeana for organizing this event and the ESB and National Archives for graciously granting me permission to use some of the images presented here. I've been studying the Shannon Scheme for about 13 years now and will be sharing part of my research in a different breed altogether, defining race and identity among workers on the Shannon Scheme. While it certainly won't be exhaustive, I hope that it will spark additional conversation. On a pleasant Sunday morning in March 1925, two old men from Limerick contemplated how the Shannon scheme would alter their vantage point from film and bridge. According to the story, Michael and Tom puffed their pipes contentedly as they gazed reflectively into the depths of the Shannon. The loungers seemed to share with the great river a certain serenity of spirit, but this local sense of peace and familiarity was abruptly disturbed by the presence of foreigners. As strange words tripped from strange tongues of German engineers, they grudgingly called the Shannon schemers, who had arrived to discuss blasting, damming, and excavating. 
As more engineers joined the others, brandishing maps and bustling about, the tranquil mood on the bank of the river had shifted and the harmony of the scene had been broken. Troubled by what they'd seen, the old men's anxiety manifested as a pessimistic take on the whole project. Shannon ski my eye, says Tom discontentedly. They'll soon be trying to turn night into day and the poor old Shannon will be running in the air before these young fellows are done with it. As they pondered these uncertainties, each buried himself gloomily in his thoughts while the Shannon, undisturbed and untroubled, continued its somnolent way. As this story in the Limerick Leader indicated, the presence of diverse workers on the scheme complicated questions of racial identity in Ireland. This presentation will discuss how the Shannon scheme challenged residents near Limerick to reassess their own regional identity at a time when Irishness was being contested on a national stage. As workers from Cork or Connemara were singled out for unfamiliar cultural and linguistic practices, the project became a theoretical battlefield where regional tensions erupted and efforts to speak of a homogenous Irish national community were tested. The presence of German engineers on the Shannon scheme, therefore, was not the only factor that encouraged the Free State to consider the linked issues of race and nationality. Defining Irishness was as much an internal process among the Irish as it was an external process vis-a-vis -vis other Europeans. I will highlight how the Shannon scheme could be a racially divisive project that strained the superficial bonds of national identity and provided opportunities to consider what it meant to be Irish. Cork was considered to be especially manipulative and shady in the minds of some Limerick residents. For example, when Thomas McLaughlin and Patrick McGilligan were invited to Cork to talk about national electrification, the Limerick leader implied that these Cork men wanted to get the too big of the scheme in some hidden sanctum within the sacred precincts of the city. Likening Cork to a baby snatcher, the correspondent cautioned, Knowing the predatory and pioneer instincts of our esteemed neighbors, I here and now give solemn warning to all local patriots who have a care for that puling infant in its midst, the Shannon scheme, and make it their business to see that on some dark and wild night, it not be spirited away to eventually come into its prime among foster parents whose lullaby bears strong traces of that medium of speech used by all government officials, the Cork accent. Speaking of their southern neighbors as though they were enemies, the journalists called for vigilance because they never descend to the vulgarity of threatening you openly, and that's how unsuspecting innocent people like us get it in the neck. Such characterizations of Cork were hardly flattering, but they suggest that the project's importance was not always based on national prosperity. Jockeying for benefits to come could also be portrayed as a cutthroat regional competition. Although some locals would have interpreted this as rubbish, for many, Corkmen were a real threat to the community in the sense that they were filling jobs on the site that many men from Limerick believed belonged to them. A similar flood of Connemara men from the west to Limerick to find work on the site exacerbated the debate about what it meant to be Irish. Regional differences were most pronounced as people of Limerick considered the unfamiliar language, culinary habits, and cultural practices expressed by men from the West. While these tactics parallel discussions of race related to Germans at the site, as we shall see, they also undermined a shared sense of Irishness. The rhetoric may have been the same, but the implication of these differences turned the process of identity formation on its head. Othering Germans allowed the Irish to define their own national characteristics in opposition to perceived traits. By emphasizing that the men from Connemara were utterly dissimilar to the people in Limerick, the very idea that they had any sense of a shared national identity became less credible. Although cultural nationalists lauded those who hailed from the Gueltoc, including Connemara, as a place where Irish culture remained pure and untouched by British influences, the treatment of workers in, from this region revealed that the people of Limerick viewed these idealized figures as more exotic peculiarities than as exemplars of a shared heritage. Despite the push by cultural nationalists and representatives of the state to recognize the people of the West as the true Irish by promoting the Gaelic language and other cultural practices, the Shannon scheme became a site where Irishness was revealed as more complicated and less homogenous than nationalist doctrine would prefer. 
In fact, natives considered the Connemara men who sought employment on the scheme to be foreigners in much the same way as German contractors. Whereas Michael and Tom, the men mentioned at the start, heard strange words tripped from strange tongues of Germans, the same could be said of Irish workers who were unfamiliar with the Gaelic spoken in Connemara. To them, Gaelic was as indecipherable as German. These perceived differences led one writer for the Limerick leaders to state that the Shannon scheme, or at least the varied polyglot collection of individuals it embraces within its all-embracing toils, is cynically designated by quite a number of people, the League of Nations. While the journalists admitted that one would, as a result, expect to find and not be disappointed a rather interesting and varied collection of widely different types of humanity, the focus of the piece was on the Connemara men, who the writer personally considered one of the most interesting from the psychological point of view. The religious practices, clothing, and other cultural markers of the Connemara men were indicative of perceived fissures within Irish identity that had decidedly regional tones. Some journalists attempted to elevate these cultural traits of the Connemara men as ideals, practices and lifestyles that were truly Irish and thus worthy of praise. Sketching their physical appearance and gray wool clothing, one observer concluded that the Connemara worker is mild of gaze and looks out at the world world with eyes that are wholly innocent and possessing that soft melancholy so peculiar to the Celtic temperament of which he may be said to be the most unspoiled and perfect specimen. The specificity with which the writer depicted a typical Katamara man suggested that his dress and demeanor made him stand out from the rest of the Irish. He may have symbolized the perfect specimen of the Irish race, but in many ways he lay outside the bounds of what was normal. This classification of the Connemara man as unspoiled also tended to place him in a category defined by what the Irish used to be, not what the Irish were becoming. For example, the writer previously mentioned also provided an account of the typical day for a Connemara man on the Shannon scheme. He stated that most men rose and immediately foregathers with his kind, they are immensely clannish, implying that the rest of the Irish were not. At the grocers, he noted that they had animated conversations in Gaelic before pooling their money and sending in their representative with the best English language skills, rejecting the notion that the people of Connemara are drinkers, as some would like us to believe. The author claimed no. Instead, he buys groceries and strikes as canny of a bargain as any housewife. The image painted here was significant for two reasons. First, the Connemara men were portrayed as clannish in their experiences at the grocery store. Presumably, all other workers handled their own affairs and didn't rely on a representative to bargain on behalf of a group. Second, the author referred to the stereotype that the men from this region were known to imbibe. In labeling the Connemara workers responsible, the writer contributed to an effort that glorified the West and expressed the usually omitted cultural divides within the new Irish state. Speaking of the Gwale Talk Commission, established in 1925 to write a report on the social, economic, and linguistic issues affecting Gaelic-speaking districts, one writer for the Limerick Leader argued that the Gaelic language as a mark of Irish identity had been transposed to Ardnacrusha, where men from Connemara had come to work. He stated, I beg to differ from the commission as to the present precise location of the home of the Gweltak. It is no longer in Connemara. It has shifted, taken wing, and sought fresh fields and pastures anew. I hereby declare that the present home of the last of the race may be said to exist in the sphere of operations of the Shannon Power Works. The Shannon scheme area is full of it. it, is overrun with it, it permeates the whole atmosphere of the place, the beautiful language of our fathers. Seventy years after the project was completed, 94-year-old Michael Flannery, a former worker at the site and lifelong resident of Clonlara, recalled the Connemara men in much the same way as his contemporaries did during the scheme's construction. When asked by the ESB interviewer if there was much in the way of a rivalry between men from different parts of Ireland and if any of them were clannish, he replied, the Connemara men were, you see, but I think they were made to be because fellows were sneering at them. They had to be more religious to be clannish, and then, of course, they were talking their own language. 
Pressed to explain why the men were sneered at, Flannery replied that this was largely the result of typical animosity between young men, but that other men at the site saw disparities in the types of pants worn by the Connemara men and the fact that many of them were not married. Though he noted linguistic differences created difficulties between German and English-speaking Irish, he acknowledged that this divide was far greater where the Connemara men were concerned. He said that the Germans always distinguished between the Irishmen and the Connemara men. They thought that the Connemara men were a different breed altogether. Not only were the men from the West perceived to possess conspicuous cultural and linguistic differences, but they were also accused of belonging to a separate race entirely. This was evident on the evening of September 4th, 1927, when a fight broke out between approximately 40 Connemara men and other laborers on the scheme. According to the papers, the fight was the result of a feud that had existed among Connemara men and other workers, that the former were the object of jibes and other forms of insult because of their meager knowledge of English. Fourteen Connemara men were arrested and put on trial for attacking fellow workers with sticks, stones, and bottles, and prisoners were formally charged with conspiring to commit a felony, causing grievous bodily harm, and with damage to property. The article also stated that there was great public interest in the hearing at which one witness gave evidence damning the Connemara men involved for apparently wanting to wipe out the civilized race. The testimony given by two of the victims of the attack shed light on the perceived differences between the Connemara men and other Irishmen at the site. Daniel Harley testified that he was sitting on Bernard McAleese's bed when the Connemara men tossed a bottle through the window before attacking him with their fists and a stick, knocking him unconscious and sending him to the hospital for 14 days to recover. Harley focused on language as a means to demonize his attacker, further condemning their physical violence by highlighting the foreignness of their words and the fear this aroused in him for not being able to understand the motivation behind the attack. He stated that when he asked one of his attackers why he carried a stick, he muttered something in Irish. During cross-examination, Harley denied that he'd ever called them dirty Connemara men. However, the lawyer got to the heart of the matter when he asked Harley, do you consider yourself a superior being? To which Harley answered, I do not. The lawyer for the Connemara men argued that his clients got along well with other workers and that they were driven to violence by Harley's constant slurs about their language and culture. This testimony hinted that the Connemara men were perceived to rank lower in the hierarchy of Irishness, though the victim denied this for obvious legal reasons. However, some members of the public defended the Connemara men in this incident by attacking the ways in which one writer depicted details of the fight in the Limerick Leader. In a letter to the editor, M.V. Trayers of Galway railed against an earlier writer who'd used slurs to describe the Connemara men as ignorant because they spoke the vernacular, a distinctive badge of Ardnacrusha culture, and in their rustic disposition brooded over what they considered insults. The writer had concluded interested spectators regard these hardy sons of toil as something of a different race. Trayers, appalled by this insult, replied, perhaps the race Pierce lived amongst and died for, the race Casement helped and struggled for, the race McNeil worked for and studied amongst, instead of viewing the Connemara men's ties to Gaelic culture as a mark of inferiority, Trayers celebrated their status among cultural and political nationalists, countering a further stereotype that the Connemara men were heavy drinkers who were prone to violent outbursts. He stated that since the inception of the operations on the Shannon scheme, the boys from Connemara have congregated in their huts at night and recited the rosary in Irish prior to retiring. This religious devotion, according to Treyers, was a real issue behind the attack on the workers. He wrote that this devotional practice was made a joke by some of the less religiously inclined workers who adopted various practices to disturb the prayers, including throwing boots and garbage through the window at the huts in which the Connemara men prayed. Another citizen wrote a letter to the editor defending the Connemara men and stated the word slung at some of the defendants that they should behave themselves as a civilized race must be treated with contempt. 
This writer countered arguments that the Connemara men were uncivilized and prone to violence by acknowledging that there were preserved in Connemara among its native speakers characteristics of tender human feeling, charity, religious fervor, and an outlook untainted by modern habits tending to degeneracy that would perhaps put many of their revilers to shame. In the January 2009 issue of Hedgemaster, James P. Walsh wrote an article recalling his father's experiences on the Shannon scheme. According to Walsh, his father vividly remembered this riot between Irish workers based on language. Walsh recalled that workers who spoke only English, who were the majority, resented those like my father, who came from the Gwilshawk, who spoke Irish, or who, like my father, could speak English but felt more at home speaking Irish. He imparted to his son that English speakers tended to congregate together in part because English speakers looked down on the Irish speakers as hopelessly backward and let those feelings be known. Walsh's father participated in the riot and was proud to remember that he knocked down a larger opponent and that one of the German supervisors who witnessed the fight said in effect, good work, Patty. The foreman may have known that my father's name in Irish was Padraig or Patrick in English, but it was more likely that for the Germans working on the scheme, all of the Irish workers were Paddies. We've seen how Irishness and racial attitudes were defined within the boundaries of the nation state. So let's turn now to how they were shaped by German workers. Establishing what made the Germans German and thus not Irish was an important consequence of the Shannon scheme and was typically expressed through observable cultural characteristics, including language, food, religion, and other attributes that were perceived to be unique to the German race. In 1929, the Kildare Observer reprinted a racist caricature of Germans from the Irish Times, in which the writer focused on language and food, two of the most common cultural signifiers of difference. The fictional account read, the Germans and the Irishmen working on the Shannon scheme do not fraternize to any great extent, but a story is told of two who did. The German always had rabbit pie for lunch and every day he shared this dainty with an Irish workman. By the way, said the Irishman, where do you get your rabbits? I never see any around here. I, replied the German, I shoot them. Every day they make noise outside the house and I shoot. But rabbits do not make noise, said the Irishman. Doch, doch, was the reply. They go, meow, meow. Eating cats certainly made a fool of the German, but it also implied that the Irishman, who was unknowingly sharing in the delicacy, was duped by the foreigner and was victim to his ineptitude at negotiating the cultural divide. While the university-educated German engineer in all likelihood did not struggle to tell a cat from a rabbit, the point of the joke was to emphasize their strangeness as a means of deflating the perception of German superiority. Though curiosity over German cuisine was not always expressed in a derogatory way, it was frequently used as a means to distinguish cultural differences. The Claire Champion published an article that similarly relied on food and language as particular identifiers of Germanness. The German canteen bore testimony to the great national weakness for sausage. There seemed to be innumerable varieties of the dainty, every shape and size and color imaginable, some of them with names which, judging by their length, embodied a detailed list of the ingredients. By classifying the Germans in terms of what they ate and how they spoke, social commentators were in effect identifying what the Irish were not. Michael Flannery, who interviewed with the ESB as noted earlier, also recalled his encounters with German cuisine. He told the archivist that he used to have lunch with an older German during the workday, who really explained to me all about the bacon. They eat it raw, you know. They shove it up a chimney and let it cook away there and go up and take a bite off of it and eat it. However, this cooking method did not bother the Irishman who claimed the brain was absolutely delightful. Richard Hayward published an account of his travels in Ireland in August 1939 called Where the River Shannon Flows, and his prejudice towards the Germans was pronounced as he looked on food preferences more with contempt than curiosity. He quipped that at Ardna Crusha, they were artificially sustained in what was virtually a transplanted German town. German food was imported 
German beer was brought over and very little of the Irish money paid in wages to these unpleasant, inhumanly efficient, humorless, bombastic automatons. Almost every one of them, a potential Hitler, was spent in Ireland. Though an Englishman, the writer assumed himself qualified to speak for the Irish when he observed, the Germans were not popular around Limerick. Their national characteristic are poles apart from those of the Irish people. Lamenting that a British firm was not hired, Hayward recalled that a local man had once told him, be damn it if we'd had the British at Ardnacrusha, they'd have drunk the town dry every Saturday, for they're the lads that know how to spend their money. The Germans, damn, all they're good for but bombastin and bloody war. It's not men they are, but machines. By dehumanizing the Germans and emphasizing their propensity for violence, it became possible for the Irish to obscure their own recent hostilities and subhuman status perpetuated by the British. The resentment over Germans sending money home and importing their own food was often coupled with fears that there would be too many of them sneaking into Ireland for work and that they may never leave. In a newspaper article entitled The Shannon Scheme for Native Deportation, Ireland for the Foreigner, the anonymous writer speculated that it is clear to anyone with eyes to see that the Germans are not going to clear out of the country when this contract is finished, if it ever is. And again, rumor has it that they are allowed to import their motor cars free of duty, and some would also say of their foodstuff and cigars and tobacco. The writer described visiting Limerick where he could imagine himself in Berlin, considering the way he was jostled by hordes of German men, women, and children. Placing the blame for this perceived injustice squarely on the shoulders of government leaders, the writer accused them of opening a money order office in Ardnacrusha for the sole benefit of Germans so they could send away the money wrung from the sweat and blood of the Irish taxpayer. The writer embraced hyperbole by proclaiming, we have heard of plantations under Elizabeth and Cromwell, but it is nothing compared to the German plantations under President Kostgrave's beneficent rule. Echoing the xenophobic British press, this writer argued that the solution to this awful state of affairs was to stand firm and insist that the foreigner must go. In addition to newspaper and political commentary on Germans, foreigners at Arden and Crusher were also featured in local folk songs about the project as a means of demarcating Irishness. For example, a popular song at the time contained the following lines, hoist up the red flag and pull down the green for the Germans are blowing up the road to Parteen. This song emphasized the militarism of the Germans, the red flag, as a threat to the Irish state and further alluded to this violence and warmongering stereotype by depicting the building of the dam in destructive, blowing up, rather than constructive terms. James Lynch's song, When the Shannon Starts Flowing Down Donegal, is representative of songs about the scheme because it shared a sense of optimism about the future and pride in Irish initiative. One verse of his song was particularly relevant to the discourse on Irish-German relations. At least so they told me, and Germans don't lie, except in their beds till Sunday goes by, and old Ardna Crusha is like Berlin, where the lingo they speak starts a pain in your chin. The first two lines of this verse express a slight to Lutherans, who were often perceived as less devout churchgoers in contrast to Irish Catholics, whose religion was central to national belonging. Like others who pointed to language as a feature for establishing difference, Lynch's last two lines conveyed a dislike for the spoken German heard around Ardna Crusha, and in doing so reflected that the Shannon scheme inadvertently created a space for discussion about race and national identity at a time when these issues were of paramount importance. An issue that received special attention in the press was the number of Germans employed on the Shannon scheme in comparison to the number of Irish workers. It was important for people to know how many foreigners were in the country and accurate figures were vital for combating wild speculations found in the pages of news outlets like Honesty that the government was scheming to conceal the presence of 5,000 to 10,000 Germans. While German aggression was alluded to elsewhere as a definitive 
racial characteristic, specific cases of violence often pointed to Irishmen as the instigators. For example, in 1929, two Irishmen were charged with assaulting a pair of Germans, and the court hoped to situate the case as an exception in an otherwise very good and cordial relations which have existed between German and Irish workmen and the German and Irish overseers. However, this statement of goodwill was overshadowed by the trial of John Joseph Cox, who was accused of murdering Jacob Coons. The evidence against Cox suggested that he had followed Coons on the 21st of December 1928 and hit him over the head in order to steal his money, but killed him in the process. While the papers never claimed that Cox targeted Coons because he was German, some did rely on stereotypes of Germans in order to explain Cox's motive. The Limerick leader noted that there can be no doubt that the deceased was murdered for his money. Being typical of his nation, Coons was a thrifty man and had saved a considerable sum of money. But what was more striking was the plea for mercy issued by the jury, who found Cox guilty when they expressed that they were of the opinion that the death may not have ensued if the skull of the deceased had been stronger. At a time when measurements of the thickness of one's skull carried determinative weight in racial theories, this statement explicitly faulted the German's bone structure for failing to withstand the blow by the Irishman and implicitly relieved Cox of full responsibility. Violence between German and Irish workers received considerable attention in the press, casting a cloud over race relations that was not entirely justified. Yet these clashes revealed the significant role of racial stereotypes. If not explicit violence, the relationship between Germans and the Irish was also described with indifference. The Irish Times claimed that the strict discipline expected by Siemens and the importation of German methods is not popular locally. Apparently, progress was not made in the following two months when the Irish Times suggested that it would be idle to pretend that the Germans are popular. In fact, there is virtually no fraternization. But as this example demonstrates, Germans working for Siemens were exposed to attacks in the press that were infused with racial prejudice. In the summer of 1926, the Anglo-Celt advertised a social gathering for people in the area of Drum Bess. Though the paper didn't mention the sponsor, a dance was arranged for the community to attend on Sunday the 18th of July. The headline read, No Germans Wanted, and the unnamed organizers of the dance planned to charge admission in the aid of a good cause, which the paper defined as opposing the Shannon scheme. The labor dispute over workers' wages had been settled months before, but this didn't appear to stifle criticism of the project among some in County Cabin. Newspapers, especially local ones, printed stories of congenial relationships between the Germans and the Irish as they lived amongst each other near Limerick. For example, when three Germans were taking measurements on the Shannon in 1926, their boat capsized, and after a rather exciting experience, the engineers were rescued by Abby and Sand fishermen and taken ashore, none the worse for their immersion. In addition, they also played sporting events with one another. When a local cinema fire killed 46 people, it was noted that the event evoked the deepest sympathy and regret amongst workers of all classes on the Shannon scheme. In an effort to help those affected by the disaster, a movement was started both in the Irish and German camps to organize hurling tournaments and concerts, the proceeds to go to the national fund initiated by the president. Finally, the height of cultural assimilation occurred when, according to a Siemens executive, a number of German workers had married Irish girls and had taken them back to Germany. Germans and Irish alike preferred to lend credence to the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that existed between the two nationalities. Not surprisingly, the Limerick leader drummed up much excitement about a visit from the Bremen crew, a group of German airmen who successfully piloted the first transatlantic flight from the east. At a reception for this group in Limerick, both national anthems were played to the crowd of 15 to 20,000 people who gathered to hear the airmen speak. One member of the crew, Major James Fitzmorris, an Irish pilot and veteran of the Great War, told the crowd that the recent flight of his colleagues and himself was a German-Irish combination, and they succeeded. In Limerick, they had a similar combination. People were willing to work 
cheerfully and energetically towards that end. A German crew member similarly claimed to be happy to know that so many countrymen of his own had combined with the Irish people to build up a scheme that would be productive. Once it became clear that the Germans would be leaving Ireland at the project's completion, the Limerick leader offered them a generous farewell in 1930. It gushed, Limerick people will bear testimony to the high character, probity, and integrity of the German men and women who lived and worked amongst them for the past four or five years. They were a hardworking, industrious people who minded their own business. They gave no offense to no one, but by their industry and enterprise gave us lessons that we could profit by if taken to heart. In their dealings, too, they were always straightforward and free from any pettiness. They were a splendid type of manhood and womanhood. Such praise of splendid manhood and womanhood was the result of extended interactions with the foreigners and had certainly not been the express greeting upon the Germans' arrival in Limerick. For people living in and near Limerick, the Shannon scheme fundamentally altered not only their sense of place, but also their understanding of the ways in which their regional identity made them at once both unique and representative of Irish national identity. Local and regional perspectives indicated that Irishness was multifaceted and was just as much challenged or supported from within national boundaries as from without. Establishing difference between what was Irish and what was German was key to imagining the project as an Irish accomplishment, and whether that difference was based on race, language, cuisine, or other cultural attributes, the Shannon scheme certainly facilitated discussions about these elements of national identity at critical time in Irish. Irish history. The intersections of German, British, and Irish nationalities that converged on the project illustrates that defining the contours of race and Irishness must be viewed not only in terms of a national effort, but also as the product of imperial and international circumstances. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela. Um... We have, we'll make a live connection with Kena uh, Michaela, I think, and we should be able to ask her some questions. Yeah, Michaela, nice to uh, see you. Um, thank you for your talk. It was uh, fast. I think we, we, some of us struggled a bit to, to uh, catch up, but I, so you all know, these will be available afterwards, um, so you can take them slightly at your own uh, pace. Um, but I'm sure there will be some questions uh, for you from uh, the audience. Anybody, any questions specifically to Michaela? If not, I'll start the ball rolling. Um, Michaela, you mentioned that there were, there were Germans and Irish and British um, uh, involved in the building of the dam and involved in um, the, the dam itself. Uh, were there other nationalities uh, there as well? Yeah, one of the things that I look at in my research is tourism to the site. And that was a huge effort on the part of the ESD to try to get people to come to the site. And they were actually responding as well just to the huge number of people who were pouring in to see the construction underway. And so the newspapers like to report on people coming from India, New Zealand, Canada, the United States, and even even when they talked about German tourists who were coming over who were not part of the project, they often spoke of them in very different terms than how they would have spoken about the, the workers. That's, uh, that's very interesting. And, and when off the Germans um, uh, left, was that the end of the conversation about race? I was very struck um, with the, particularly the stuff that was in the newspapers. Uh, did that uh, conversation continue? The conversation actually did continue. There was a, a really interesting story. There was a, a case in 1933, so several years after the Germans had left, and there were four Irishmen who were convicted of 19 charges, I think, of coining. They were um, you know, making currency, and in their defense, they claimed that it was 
the Germans' fault because a German on the Shannon scheme taught them how to coin. And so the papers often played up those connections. And another thing that I think is really interesting too is the fact that oftentimes when people would remember uh, and record oral histories after the fact, they often saw what happened on the Shannon scheme in light of World War II. And so there would be a lot of references, for example, in those oral histories to say comparing the uh, German camps or the Irish camps at Ardnacrusha to concentration camps in Germany, or there would be uh, conversations in different periodicals uh, as late as 2009, where people were uh, commenting on perhaps Hitler's involvement, even though the, the construction of the Shannon scheme predated his rise to power. So there was a lot of confusion there in terms of how people were talking about race and the role of the Germans. Hmm. Uh, and we, we've got a, a follow-up uh, question to that online, which was whether sort of schemes and activities to encourage the different nationalities to socialise. So did they have um, Kayleys with uh, Germans or what, 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 was anything that, that, like that go on? There, there were. Uh, and like I mentioned, in addition to them, uh, you know, having lunch together in, in some cases or, you know, playing sports together to support those victims of that fire, they also were very much, I think, involved in each other's communities. And so I think the image or the perception that there was a lot of animosity, there were many other examples in which they were, you know, getting along just fine and, and coming together and sharing those experiences on the site. Yeah, because it always tends to be about people. Is it, I think we've got a question at the back. Sorry, it's okay to just put on the mask. Um, so I don't really have a question. Um, and I'm here because I'm very interested in, in the, um, the social element of it. And um, I, I'm curious because um, I have a connection with it, and I'm sure many people here have. And uh, so this is the start of my journey to, fo to find out more. Um, my grandfather, Martin Kennedy, uh, he was a blacksmith in, in uh, Ardna Crusha for, I think, like 30 years in the power station. And I have some of his documentation. And I'm just so, you know, and definitely social class. He came from Broadford, County Clare. There were 14 of them, tiny house. All of his family emigrated. So I'm, I'm just so curious how he, did he cycle down? How did he get there? How did he see the ad? So then he met a local woman in Parteen, uh, Alice Kennedy. She was a widow. And he married, and I, I think he used to go to Brown's Pub. I know she loved the snug in Brown's Pub, apparently. And they met and they married. But so, so that lovely connection, it was always a connection of partying. Uh, when I heard from my father, who was born in 1924, you know. So I'm interested in this uh, Farrell gentleman, where your family are connected with engineers. Mine was, like, what was the work of the blacksmith? And what was Martin Kennedy, you know, what was his life like? So then... Uh, onto that then, my aunt, right, my grandmother's daughter, my, um, she married one of the German engineers. So it's really, it's, it's fascinating when there's a lot of talk about violence and aggression, but how that connection, fascinating, how they met. Did they meet through Martin Kennedy, the blacksmith? Did they meet around Brown's pub? Um, and then she went to Germany afterwards. Um, with, with went back, but I have such sketchy information, and if my father were still alive, I'm sure there would be great stories, you know. So while I don't have a question, I just wanted to make that contribution. You know. I think there must have been a lot uh, of, of that going on. What, what, what strikes me as, a, as a, a foreigner coming in here is actually this is such a, a welcoming place. So in some ways I'm very surprised. Maybe it's a, it's a kind of rite of passage that all nations have to go through to come out the other side. But I have never felt as welcome anywhere, um, and I've lived in all sorts of places in the world, as I have here. And it is very much the openness of the attitude, the interest in uh, other people and what they're doing, the time that they spend uh, asking you about it. So I would expect there to have been a lot more 
fraternising um, than, than maybe is um, recorded. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Michaela. I would say that I think there was probably more emphasis on the times in which there was struggle than recording the times in which everyone was getting along because that's what stuck out to people. And I think that uh, to build on the question that was asked earlier about the role of the British, the Shannon scheme was very much a project about demonstrating Ireland's independence. And so that independence not only had to be established in, in light of the British not being there, but also how do you establish that independence and really assume this role of this being an Irish accomplishment if the German engineers are, are working on the site as well. And I think I'm right in saying, but maybe somebody here can correct me, that um, th this was conceived uh, sort of when under British rule, but actually nothing happened. And it was only after independence and Thomas McLaughlin that, that uh, it became more than, well, it became a much, much bigger vision for a start. And then uh, it was enacted. And I think that's also quite a testimony to the time and, and the spirit of, of the time. I don't know if I'm right or I've made that up from something I read. <laughs> That's correct. Um, well, somebody actually online, Michaela, asked uh, why you chose this subject for your, your, your study as a, um, an American coming over the pond. What, what, what motivated you to do this? Well, I was actually researching with Jason Knurk uh, at Central Washington University, and he studies Ireland in the 1920s. And so I was doing a lot of reading about the 1920s, and I came across references to the Shannon scheme, and there really wasn't a whole lot of work at the time that was being done on it. And I think that the more I read and the more I looked into the sources, I just found the project to be fascinating from many different angles. And so for me, the promotion motion is fascinating what the ESB was coming out with in terms of its conversation about gender and housewives and tourism and religion. There were so many different, I think, opportunities to really talk about Ireland more broadly by using the Shannon scheme as a lens. And so for me, it just, it, it ticked all the boxes in terms of the types of things that I'm interested in as a historian. And, and I'm assuming you came and spent some time here and uh, walked up and down the, the dike and saw the magnitude of the, the, the scheme. I did. I did. I took a tour and it was wonderful. I was a little afraid of heights, but uh, it was absolutely worth it. One of my big disappointments this year was uh, I was um, I have a, a large Dutch barge. It's 17 metres by 4 metres. And uh, I got as far as Killaloo. And I rang them up and they said, all four turbines are running. We don't recommend it. Then I spoke to Pat Lysett, who many of you will know. And he said, mm, if it was mine, I probably wouldn't bring it. <laughs> so anyway, next year, I am going to come down through that. Uh, I really, really, really want to do that. Um, anybody got any things they would like to ask Michaela? Tom. Was language a barrier? Because obviously the majority of Limerick men probably spoke English and German spoke German. Did the Germans learn English or how did that work out? Yes, many of the Germans actually did know uh, English and what uh, the what the newspapers often reflected on was how quickly they picked up on the English language and they would make jokes about words that were similar, but they they often praised the Germans for learning English and speaking it as well as they did. So there was a, a bit of a, a mixed message here in terms of, I think, those who were trying to establish this sense of difference on the basis of language and those who were trying to, uh, you know, emphasize that sense of, you know, this is a cooperation and a partnership. So um, I think it really went both ways. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, one other comment, which I thought was quite nice online. Uh, uh, somebody has submitted um, that her father, Frederick Dupe, 
or Yupa, worked at Ardna Crusher, Port Arlington and Port, Le Port Leash. During his time at Ardna Crusher, in his spare time, he designed and built the main telephone system, which allowed the company to phone all of its offices without going through the national and local exchanges, thus saving time and cost. The system was used until the 1950s. I love it when you get the sort of additional little facts that come out. Um, I don't know whether this is a question for you or for, for somebody in the room. The Pauline um, O'Dwyer was asking that the, the old Shannon River Trust have said that the salmon supplies are at 5% of what they were before Ardna Crusher dams were built. Um, obviously, every needs electricity, but was anything done to restore the fish supplies to the Shannon River by the ESB? That might be question really for Deirdre. I don't know if she's still online. Uh, or oh, Peggy. Yes. Um, before the Shannon scheme, there was something like 55 feet at a drop, and it was famous for Shannon fishing. So even Randolph Churchill caught a, well, they said a 50 pound <laughs> salmon. So it, it did, it changed, it changed that completely. The Falls of Ness now is just a slow meandering little Little River, well, it's the Shannon, but it, it completely changed that. Because I think, was it 80% of the, the flow? I think, it, yeah, 80% of the flow went down the, the head race. So, yeah, that, that completely changed the Shannon fishing. The, the falls of the Ness and the, the, the Enrights made rods, and that was a big business. Um, so, yeah, it did. It certainly did. The salmon. The, the salmon couldn't yeah, the, the, the actually leap up yeah, the, the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, any other questions for Michaela? I am going to thank uh, Michaela for her talk. And so thank you, Michaela, very much. Um, I think we learnt a lot. I would like to pass over to Peggy, um, who is going to start off with a story um, in relation to uh, Ardna, in relation to everything that she has done um, in order to make this happen. Now, Peggy is one of our uh, volunteer docents. Actually, she's many things. Um, but the bit that we know her for most is her <laughs> being a a volunteer docent at the Hunt Museum. She's been here for the past eight years. She does guided tours. Um, she's done a lot of work on, in terms of the outreach to schools, nursing homes, and our daycare and the daycare centres. Um, and recently, you were involved in the Heritage Week handling sessions, weren't you? When we had sort of medieval objects um, being handled. Um, since retiring, Peggy has pursued her interest in local history and heritage especially in Clonlara, where she lives, um, perfectly close to the, <laughs> the epicentre of what we're talking about here. Uh, the Ardna Krusha project was particularly interesting to her because the project changed the whole landscape uh, for this area. And uh, she feels it's an opportunity to hear the human stories, and that's, um, I think, very much what we've been doing uh, behind the development and the maintenance and the running of the power station. Uh, and uh, she felt that to be a great... Privilege. I think one of the things that we should mention here was the work that have quite a few of the docents did, uh, Margaret's here um, as well, who, um, when during lockdown, they actually did quite a lot of ringing up of people and interviewing them, uh, which I think was quite nice as well in terms of having some external um, contact and, and to bring those memories uh, to the fore. But anyway, May, uh, Peggy, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. I, I was looking for an image. Did, did you? Yes. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, firstly, I would just... Oh, it's gone. <laughs> it's just the image. And when you spoke, I said, this, this is so much part of all of us. We said, why didn't we ask our parents or our whatever relations or older people? So to me, this is what the European... European uh, um, project is all about. It's collecting the memories, collecting the stories in time. And um, 
My first story this evening that I will share with you started way back in 1887 with a man called Jack Ryan. Now, he wasn't a relation. He, was, he moved to Clonlara a few years before the scheme began, and he married uh, a local woman, Ellen Heffernan. He started working in the scheme in 1925, and he was a foreman of a large group of mainly labourers, maybe some of our men from um, Connemara. But his, his main skill was in drilling the boreholes for the explosions. And for the embedded rock, this, he had to go down eight metres, and then he had to layer the sand and the explosions. The large boulders, they used explosives as well to break them up, or to trim the, the edges of the canal, the uh, explosives were used. So it was very dangerous, noisy work. And there was a lot of damage done both to people and to property in the area. Um, meanwhile, his wife, Ellen, she took in lodgers, um, and you all know how many people, 4,000, 5,000 people descended on the area. So anybody that had any bit of um, house or anything, they, they took in the lodgers. But Ellen also ran a shebeen at the back of the house. So that house is still standing, and it's a protected structure. Jack Ryan himself was an amateur photographer, and I interviewed his daughter, Marie Dennehy, for this project, and she produced an amazing collection of photographs from the scheme that both Jack and his son, John Joe, had taken. Now, the uh, Ryan family intend to uh, donate these photographs to the, to the ESB archives. So that, that was a major find. Jack himself left the scheme when it finished in 1929, and he continued uh, working in local quarries, quarries, blasting rock, and he died in 1969. So that's one of the human faces of all the, the pieces we have seen. Now, Deirdre was talking about the opening of the scheme in 1929, in the 22nd of July, and W.T. Cosgrove opened it. And there was a young man, 14-year-old young man, who decided to cycle down and see what was happening. And his daughter, he's here today, Margaret Horn, and Margaret will tell us his story. Thanks, Margaret. Is my effects that it had on the countryside and of course he was very excited when uh, finally the scheme was ready to be launched and he decided that he would cycle down to Arna Krusha uh, to see this momentous occasion and um, as we saw in one of the pictures there W.T. Crossgrove had his two small boys with him I'd say aged about seven or eight Liam Cosgrove and his brother Michael and my father recalls playing around with the two boys while the uh, ceremonies were going on. And he was always very proud of the, of the fact. But it's a funny thing then, um, our, even though we, we were only, I suppose, 10 miles away from Arna Krusha, we didn't get electricity until 1954. I remember it myself. So um, my grandfather also, my father's father was um, uh, he was um, very involved in local issues and um, he watched the building of the the bridges and that and uh, if you all know O'Brien's bridge, the bridge there it crosses the, the, the road uh, going up to Bridgetown that bridge was initially um, sighted further over on the Killaloo Road about a mile further on which would have imposed a lot of inconvenience to the people living in O'Brien's Bridge and Bridgetown. So um, he um, wrote the Minister of Transport and Power at the time and advocated for it to be brought back nearer so that it would be convenient for people coming from O'Brien's Bridge up to Bridgetown. And so 
That's it. Met your father oh, met. Oh yes, Mr. yeah, yeah. yeah. There yeah. when uh, yeah. 2012 was the was it the 75th? Um, yeah, um, he was invited down to um, the, the festivities or the celebration of that anniversary, and he met the the now um, deceased. Liam Cosgrove. Who was then Tisha? Who was, was the? Was no, no, he, 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 no, he was. He wasn't in yeah. that time. Yeah. And Kenny was that time, yeah. So he, he met them both, and he had his photograph taken. So he was very proud. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lovely connection, though, to meet yeah. them as children, and then uh, to be uh, yes, come, come back it, seventy-five. It, it was, years. yeah, it was. It, it was, was a lovely, yeah. It was, it was lovely. Thanks very much, Margaret. Um, and. When, when the scheme was um, finished, um, Thomas McLaughlin then started looking for engineers, and one of, the, one of the engineers was George Webster. And George was born in Kildare in 1895, and the family moved to Limerick in 1900. And George studied engineering at Galway University, and he met Thomas McLaughlin, who was an assistant lecturer in physics, and was also studying um, engineering. But World War I intervened, and um, George joined the Leinster Regiment and went uh, and served in Salonica. And while there, he he'd got a gunshot wound to the shoulder. So when he came back, he resumed his studies in Galway, and he qualified with a B-Eng in 1922. And there was only two um, graduates that year in, in engineering, uh, George Webster and Thomas McLaughlin. So it was a lovely, lovely, um, you know, coincidence. So George then went to Galway uh, working in the electric station. And as Deirdre had said, only small towns, well, bigger towns and cities had electricity. But in 1929, uh, George received a telegram from Thomas McLaughlin um, asking him to join the team of engineers at the newly bent power station at Ardna Crusha. So, um, and then at that stage, it was under the control and management of the ESB. So George moved his family down to Ardna Crusha. And today we have his son, Don, and his granddaughter, Catherine, and Don, would you like to continue the story? Yes, um, I was born and reared in Arden Crusha in one of the timber houses that was used to house some of the German workers that came to build the Shannon scheme. My memories of the house are not all that clear as I was a very small boy at the time. I was born in 1932, and um, the, when the family moved from Galway, I had, they had um, my elder brother, Ian, and my twin sisters, Joan and Dorothy. Uh, so I was a first arrival in Ardna Crusha, born in that house. Uh, I still have vague memories of the house. I'm not sure when exactly the ESB built their houses then for their st senior staff in Ardna Crusha. Around about the middle to late 1930s, I would have think, think it would have been, um, they built these flat roofed houses and um, we moved in there. In the area, it was a great place for youngsters to grow up. We were only Four, mil, four miles from Limerick City, but yet we were in the country. Uh, I remember very clearly there were a lot of rabbits around. Uh, <laughs> Despite the Germans. <laughs> uh, there were these huge fern bushes, and we used to play hide and seek in the fern bushes, and we were so taken by these fern bushes that we named the house High Fern. Uh, Sometime later on in the 40s, or I think it was late 40s, my father was uh, appointed as deputy uh, station superintendent, and we moved into a, a bigger house 
uh, not a uh, couple of hundred yards uh, from where the old High Fern was. And we took the name High Fern from the old house and brought it to the new house. And I believe that name is still on the gate pillar of the house. I was out there with a couple of years ago with my grandchildren, showing them where I used to live, and the name High Fern is still on the pole, on the gate pillar of that, the house. Your, your dad mostly worked in the control room in our. He worked in the control it? room. And you could visit him at will. And yes, we, yeah. uh, far from uh, compared with the, the security that is available now, we used to go walk over a 10 minutes walk from our house to the power station, go up in the elevator into the control room and hand him, get gifts from, or at least to hand him messages or collect messages to bring home. You, you wouldn't do it now that there's all the security that's around. <laughs> Thank you very much, Don. Thank you indeed. And another um, engineer that joined um, just before George was Joe Farrell. And Joe was born in 1900 and was educated in Castle Knock and the Royal College of Science. And like George Webster, his studies were interrupted by war, but this time it was the War of Independence. And he actually got shot outside Trinity College while on active duty for the IRA. He was sentenced to 10 years penal servitude, but he served a year now between prison and, and hospital. So he, he came out when he, again when, he, when he, he resumed his studies and he graduated in 1922. And like George then, he worked in the smaller um, electrical stations in Dublin Corporation and in Thurless. And then the same way he was asked to join, um, to join the Art Crusher. So we have his grandson here, Tom McCabe, who will fill us in on, on his uh, career in the ESB. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peg. In addition to everything you recited there, he also had the privilege of being invited over by Siemens Bonium to work in Berlin and understand the whole benefits of what hydroelectric power was able to do for the whole German economy. And I suppose the Germans were advocates of renewable, sustainable uh, solutions. He was absolutely intrigued with this, and I suppose together with McLaughlin, they were able to put a strategic plan together uh, to present to, to McGilligan to convince the Irish government that this was the way to go forward. Um, he didn't spend all his time as an engineer, uh, working on Ardner Crusher, he then eventually moved into the consumers department, um, opening up the showrooms and uh, I suppose after the electrification of Ireland, that was important to be able to do that. Um, he was also lucky enough to have his sister uh, Gertrude marry another director, Barney O'Sullivan. I thought that was quite interesting when I was doing my homework. And later on, only about a year or two years ago, a, a photograph appeared of Joe's daughter, Brenda, my mother's sister and only sister who worked actually as a demonstrator and uh, it was lovely to see her picture appear as a demonstrator showing the housewives of Ireland how it should be done to try and convince them that yes you can move away from cooking on a coal stove um, and that electricity was dependable so there were all sorts of stories uh, that came out um, and are wonderful stories to see unfortunately Joe got ill um, later in his life in 1961, um, he retired, but at that stage he had done well over 35 or 40 years in the ESB. He passed away in 1965, a couple of months before I was born. I never actually got to meet the man, but he certainly left a wonderful legacy behind him to have been part of the, the, the whole rural electrification of Ireland, to have been part of the team that designed the, the high grid network and then go out into the consumers department. So he was involved in every, every part of it. And, you know, other stories that come out, he was very friendly with Kevin Barry, uh, one of the uh, first Republicans to be shot um, while imprisoned. Um, obviously himself, he was lucky to survive um, and never ever spoke about his time in jail. It never came up, but the ESB uh, obviously never forgot that and wrote about it in, in their archives. And um, in his actual official obituary, they, they made reference to the fact that he was such a humble man, it was something he would never talk about. He was so determined to see the success of the electrification uh, and the consumer department, but that was his main mission and purpose in life. 
and it certainly inspired me to go on and work myself in the lighting the business. And um, again, great to look back and great to see other stories here of other people who are involved uh, because they all go towards you know, the great work that you're doing here in the Hunt Museum. And again, great work, Peggy. You've done a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. I think, Margaret, have you, have you a story? Well, I think with your permission that I, we, we've had, um, this is Jer Cowie here, and uh, he's been... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do I have your permission to talk about some of the... Yeah. Well, um, this is Jared's story, and uh, well, I won't go into it all because um, he, um, we've got to go through what he was willing to to, to divulge. And um, he started working at Nakusha in 1955, uh, in his early 20s. And in the early days, he cycled to work, and the power station was about say eight or nine miles from the house, and. Uh, a section of the road during the winter would be flooded. So Jared, as a young man, would take his bike on his shoulders and walk the wall that would forge over the, the river to get to, to work. And uh, his working hours, there were um, eight to six, Monday to Friday, half days and Saturdays, with an hour and a quarter for dinner. And he cycled home for dinner and back again. So that was four times going backwards and forwards. And um, there was no canteen, canteen facilities, so they went home again in the evening, and they worked a 48-hour week. And he negotiated with management for a shorter dinner time for half an hour and finished earlier. And this was a start for us as dinner in the evening. And this time, they bought sandwiches for lunch, and a burger boiler was placed in the premises. And um, this now, I can continue with the story, can I? About the burger boiler. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This is sort of <laughs> no. It's it's just it's just, it's just it's it's a funny bit, like really. And um, so they they installed a canteen and they bought sandwiches. And uh, this was a novelty. It was the first time any of them had seen a burger by you. And he said, "I'll tell you a funny story." He said, "It's true." He says, "One day, a young apprentice living away from home decided to wash his overalls in the burger boiler, and there he was with a packet of rizzo and a stick." storing his overalls in the boiler. He was suspended for two days. <laughs> so we won't, we won't mention the young man's name. And uh, it, it is, um, one of his early jobs was um, to put bore bars. They were used to insert into the banks of the canal in which pouring concrete was, ex um, was inserted to block the leaks found by bank rangers. Now bank rangers are a very important job. Every day since the operation of the canal in 1929, two bank rangers walked either side of the entire banks from the power station back, monitoring the water flow from the springs, and they recorded any increase or decrease in pressure. These records were kept in the Civil Works Department in Ardacusha. And there is a significant, if there was a significant decrease in the flow of water, bore bars were used to block the leak. The bank rangers continue this practice to the present day. The, glaze, the grazing rights were on the grassy banks were rented to farmers to allow sheep and not cattle on the land. The hoofs of the cattle would displace the earth and cause leaks, and if undiscovered, would be very damaging for the thing. Now, that was, I used to go as a child, driving out hard to crush and see loads of sheep and wondering why, you know, why there was no other. And it was the hoofs would displace the earth and That's the thing, great, you know? That's great. Thank you. Thank so you, Thank Gerard. you, Jared, for your thank contributions. You, I'm watching it now. Um, he was my mentor uh, as I served my apprenticeship. Great man. <laughs> Who's this? Uh, this is um, an online. So Danny Bolan uh, talking about Joe. Uh, Somebody's congratulations. You were a, you were a mentor of his. Yeah. You didn't get the name. Um, Danny Bolan. Oh, Danny, Danny Bolan. Oh, yeah, Danny Bolan. We have a great story about Danny Bolan. <laughs> <laughs> and then just one other thing, which actually I thought was really rather nice. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to tell that one. <laughs> no, no. Uh, Rose Ryan, um, she now lives in High Fern. Did you know that? And she says the rabbits and the ferns are still there. So Rose Ryan lives in High Fern. Um, and the rabbits and the ferns are still there. 
and you would be very welcome to visit. She'd love to make contact with you. Peggy. Okay. Um, the operation and maintenance of the power station um, was largely dependent on electricians under the supervision of the engineers. And today we have four men here who between them worked 175 years with the ESB. You know who you are. <laughs> and their stories give us a great insight on in how the power station operated. And they also reflect the huge changes because um, you know they, they would have started work in the 50s or the 60s. Um, Francis Maloney is here, and he was control room shift supervisor responsible for the operation of the plant, the generation station, and two transmission stations, among other things. But his story would cover 44 years. And then we have Martin Barry, and Martin worked as an electrician repairing and maintaining transformers. And up to 2011, all the industrial and domestic transformers were um, repaired and maintained at Arda Crusha. And now they're being, being uh, repaired and maintained by the, the, the suppliers. So Martin's story covers 49 years. And we have Pat Ahern. And Pat was technical officer responsible for the maintenance and plant and overhaul of machinery. And again, I'm, I'm really summarizing their stories. Um, but Pat has a lovely story to tell us about the, again, about the 75th anniversary celebrations and the work he did on the, the, um, the fountain. Is that okay, Pat? Yeah. <laughs> you have to say, uh, I'm a Christian, just a beautiful place for um, Work always was done to a very high standard because you had very good uh, super supervisors uh, in the station. Um, but underlying that, we had a huge amount of fun. Um, every day you went in, there was something different. Some other left that we got. And um, it was such a pleasure to work there. Um, and friendships and the socializing even with other stations. We had uh, inter-club competitions, hurling, football, badminton, you name it. Um, it was within the ESB. So um, teams from all over the country played each other each year. And um, you really met um, people from other parts of the country and built up great connections that reflected on um, being able to contact him if you had any questions or um, so it was just a marvellous place to work. We built networks and got uh, people working together, didn't it? Sport is great to put, put, bring people together, doesn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. we had a badminton club that was started in 1933 and it's still running to today. Um, the ESB supplied the hall and um, it was known as the recreation hall um, initially where a lot of things took place. And um, I suppose one thing I was involved in back in um, when Somalia was on the news, uh, myself and some more people in the station decided to get all the musicians we knew in the, in the station and outside of the station that were attached to DSB in Limerick and places um, to give of their time uh, and come and play at a function in the recreational hall. And we finished up raising a uh, good few thousand euro to send to uh, Somalia. And the support we got on that night was absolutely fabulous. And I'd just like to remember Terry McInerney, who is no longer with us, who was one of the main organizers and um, he did a, a fabulous job because he sang himself and he had loads of contacts. So, yeah, a lot of things happened. I was either having to go to work for eight hours a day with, with great fun. I think that's what um, the, everybody I spoke to, that is one of the impress strong impressions I got was it was a very good place to work and the ESB were such good employers 
and you had all this social uh, advantages as well. Yeah. Um, there's just one more person I want to talk about there, and it's Tony Fitzpatrick. And um, Tony started work in uh, 1956 and at 16, and he worked firstly as a messenger. And he, was also, he also worked as a guide and a lot of variety in his work. And then in um, 1960, he became um, a st the store man. And you can imagine the amount of stores he had to um, he did take track of, with, with a bit, not alone the, the power station, but the four substations as well, and safety officer in 1990. Um, he, Tony has 43 years of stories. And as I said, I, they're only, I really, really just skimmed the surface of those, but all their stories are on European, European website to be, to be read. And I just want to thank everybody who did so much rooting and drawers and finding stuff for me and gave me so much time and cups of tea and apple tarts and all sorts of things. And I'd just like to really, really thank everybody who contributed to this absolutely wonderful project. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Um, Eileen, do you have a story as well for us? Yeah. Um, my son-in-law, David O'Malley, he is, um, uh, uh, Tom McLaughlin married David O'Malley's aunt many moons ago, and they had four sons. And uh, I have a note here, I did um, an essay, I'll call it, on Tom McLaughlin. And um, um, uh, this is about, um, when they set up the, the stores to sell the, um, the kettles and frying pans and everything, and cookers. Um, he, um, uh, McLaughlin's approach to marketing was distinctly refreshing, ably assisted by his wife, Alwyn O'Malley, who was from Corbally in Limerick. Now, uh, and she, um, she became the first president of the Irish Women's Electrical Association, which promoted the use of electricity uh, for household use. So there you are. There. Now he was in favor of promoting women. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Yeah. We weren't just at home cooking, we were driving the men forward. Yes, um, yes. And I have to say also that she was only 20 when they got married. And, he was 30. So that's it. Uh, I have, uh, so Danny Boland also says hello to, uh, says hello to Pat um, and that you're looking great. So, uh, <laughs> um, so Danny Joe and uh, Pat were definitely uh, compadres in this whole experience. Um, Anybody, I was just wondering if uh, we can get Michaela and um, Deirdre back on. Is that feasible, guys? Are they still on Zoom or not? We're here. Oh, you're still there? Good. Um, I just wanted to check what you had thought of uh, all the stories that you have heard, Michaela. I loved hearing all of the stories. That's uh, exactly what uh, I think inspires me as a historian because those personal stories are really what the Shannon scheme to me was all about. I mean, you can talk about national electrification and the grid, but I think for the people who experienced it and the memories that they passed on to their families, this is what makes this project so exciting to me. And do we have Deidre? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, Michaela, I totally agree with you. And I think that's what's so wonderful about all these stories, because I guess the majority of our records in the archive are like the official records, the written records, and we do have an oral history as well. But it's just hearing all those um, stories that are so personal to families and, you know, the, the role that all ESB employees, you know, played in ESB, it just brings 
the whole story of both the Shannon scheme and ESB and um, so much more to light. So thank you very much. And especially just um, the last story there in particular, um, I think big shout out obviously to Alwyn McLaughlin, um, you know, because as you mentioned, like she was the first president of the Women's Electrical Association. And I think that's a really interesting piece of the whole story of the electrification of Ireland is is the role that that women played and you know as I mentioned in my talk earlier you know a lot of the advertising was very much aimed at women and um, back then because they were very much kind of the influencers and the advocators of getting um electricity in into their homes because they could see how it was going to be so transformative um, to their lives especially. So thank you especially for sharing that story. You could probably do a whole other talk on on, on, on um, that topic. Thank, thank you, Deirdre. Peggy, are we um, finished on the stories? I, well, yeah, I finished all my stories. I don't know if anybody else has a story. Then I <laughs> am going to thank all of you for coming and all of you for your contributions. Um, there's been some great feedback uh, on the online session. I think I'm right in saying, Alison, that we have recorded this. Yeah, so we are able to share the whole recording of the session, so you're, you can pick it up afterwards. You can actually see yourselves on camera um, with and without masks. We will close this session. Um, huge thank you to our speakers, to Peggy and all the other docents for all the work they did and the staff for setting it up, um, to Crude Media for really helping us on the technology. Uh, I thought we were going to do it with a mini camera there, but um, we needed a lot more than, <laughs> than I had realised. Um, we have teas and coffees downstairs. You're very welcome. Uh, down in the, well, it's not even downstairs, uh, uh, yeah, it is downstairs, in the cafe. Um, you're very welcome to have a cup of tea and a cup of coffee downstairs. Um, there's enough room downstairs for all of us to keep the social distancing. And I really thank you all for coming today and for sharing your stories. Thank you. Oh, yes, I'm going to see the Ardner Crusher. Uh. <laughs>